Good afternoon. Thank you, Cherian, for your kind invitation. Like Cherian, I no longer teach in Singapore. I used to teach in Singapore Management University. I'm now overseas and enjoying working with Taiwan. It's a wonderful open space. There's a lot of discussions of issues in the classroom and otherwise. But it's lovely to be back here. And I wanted to, I, when Cherian called, as all of us know, uh, and he asked you to do something, even if it's slightly different out of your uh, comfort zone, you always have to say yes, because it's Cherry. <laughs> so um, I spent a lot of time thinking about how I would prepare for this very difficult question, which is, do in fact elections actually serve as an equalizer for people who are disempowered? And the answer I will give to you is, not much. <laughs> They're temporary short fixes. Uh, in a sense, uh, perhaps in and around the election period. But they are, in some ways, they do have an impact. And I hope to get to that story by actually uh, giving you some little stories along the way. In the, before I get into my slides, I wanted to tell you a little bit about three people I've met in the last year. As you'll probably remember, last September, there was a bit of activity here in Singapore. And of course, during that activity, I came to visit during election time. I conducted a poll. I met many people who were actually uh, voting. And one of those individuals I wanted to tell you about is a man called Uncle Chua. He lives in Potong Pasir. Many of you will know that little constituency that used to be part of the opposition, but that now is part of the BAP. And in that area, we sat down and we had a coffee, uh, and uh, we were having a long chat. My, and in a combination of Malay, English, and Hokkien, my Hokkien is terrible. <laughs> but fortunately, I could understand a bit of some of the conversation on his side. And he was explaining to me why he was going to vote for the PAP in the next election. And he argued from his perspective that he needed to protect his flat and guarantee that his flat were going to get repairs because he had, the government had not come quite to him. And he also talked about the importance of, of the fact that uh, there had been more attention to issues of inequality, although he described it in a different lens, but saying that people who were disempowered were actually being, being taken care of to a greater degree. And, of course, as we saw, the result in Putin Pass here, Uncle Chua contributed to the 69.9% uh, that the PAP won. <laughs> the second person I want to tell you about is A.A. A. Wynn. I met her in the distance in a very remote area of northern Myanmar in November of 2015 in another election. And in that election, she described to me uh, uh, she was a rice farmer who owned very little land, in a sense she was leasing land, um, but she told me why she was going to vote for her aunt, uh, the lady, Dosu. And she grabbed me, uh, she, uh, as the first foreigner she'd ever met, and wanted me to come into her, to her particular uh, small little uh, house that she lived, and of course I wanted to go in and meet her and have a cup of tea and share with her her experience. And she talked about the hardships and how she lost her husband and how she felt that this was a sense for her for the first time that she was going to feel empowered. And I can tell you, as someone who is a political scientist, but one who is very emotive, on election day in November of 2015, when I watched the vote, I cried with that sense of emotion of people who were there from 3.30 in the morning to vote at the, at the polling stations. And A.A. Wynn, through one of another person, sent me a text, which I couldn't imagine, telling me how wonderfully pleased she was in Dosu's victory. And finally, I share with you a third vignette, the vignette of Sarawak elections in a very remote constituency on Mulu, where they have the ethnic communities live, Klapit, for the first time they were elected a particular uh, representative of that community. And in fact, they had just carved out a special seat for that community in Sarawak. And they described to me, uh, Bungo was his name, why he felt it was important to stick with the BN and to continue to vote in Malaysia for the incumbent government, seeing that this was going to bring him land. And in his mind, there was no other government besides the Barasa National. It was the whole totality of that. But he was living on the equivalent of 300 US dollars a month. 
it was a very, uh, you know, he was very malnourished. And fortunately, I'm, when you travel in Sarawak or everywhere, I was giving out the food that I have. You know, I always believe when you travel, you must travel with food, no matter where you are. <laughs> and we were having a long chat. Um, and these three vignettes uh, of uh, uh, Mr. Chua, A.A. A. Wynn, and, uh, and, and, and Wungo were all about the interesting question, uh, will the elections actually help them? Will they actually be empowered by those processes? They all voted. And my sense is, not much, but let's get to why. Here we go. Slide, please. All right, these are the questions. I'm going to begin a little bit with the regional context. We can skip this one. All right, some little bit of background. Well, everyone would understand this, but I think it's useful to kind of put this in context. In beginning to struggle with this question about inequality and equality, I think it's important to realize that the tie between equality and politics has always been one of strategic manipulations of governments in very significant ways. And even if we go back to the nation building experiences of the 60s and 70s in Southeast Asia, we see that the special tie that equality has in terms of how they justify their political legitimacy. Whether or not it's Indonesia, whether or not it was Malaysia or Thailand, the focus on rural development was an interesting part of the way of these governments basically stood up and, be, and helping to build the nation growth experience. And if we look at reports, which I'm sure many of the economists this morning may have spoke about, uh, we, one of the things that distinguishes Southeast Asia from other regions of the world is that we have an experience of successful poverty reduction and we have the same wonderful combination of reducing inequality up until 1997. And this is an, and it, so this route, this particular urban rural divide and helping rural areas distinguishes Southeast Asia from regions like Africa or, uh, or even parts of Latin America. A lot of resources, a lot of infrastructure. And for those of us who are a little bit older, my goodness, yes, I hate to think about these things. I have one of those birthdays coming up next year. You know how these things are. But you see how the rural areas have shifted. They have transformed. You have roads. Huh? You have uh, health clinics. You have facilities that 10, 15 years ago did not exist. And so these become, this is part of the legitimation process in many of the Southeast Asian experiences. Next slide, please. But we have, at the same time, a region of very deep inequality that exists. And that is, uh, and that inequality, what is interesting about and unique about Southeast Asia, is that the burden of reducing inequality is placed on the governments. You see, in other societies, it's placed on the business sector, or even on civil society or philanthropists to play an important role. But in Southeast Asia, the perception is the government should solve the problem. They're the ones who have to intervene in a particular way. And so this, again, helps us to inter intertwine that very complex relationship between politics, elections, and government activity. Because as they vote for the government, they're also voting for what they see as addressing some of their needs in a more fundamental sense of ways. And we've seen, and we've seen a a specific and, and quite significant gain in many countries. I think we can see this in Indonesia, in Thailand, parts of the Philippines, uh, but not in places like Myanmar, where the government, this is one of the exceptions in Southeast Asia. In Myanmar, formerly also known and today still known by many as Burma, they have a situation where the government abdicated their responsibility in issues of development. And this is what is going to be an interesting test ahead. But it has always been in inequality and, and things politically that have been framed. It's never been really about urban poor. It's never really been about empowering workers in a sense of uh, labor rights. Uh, although there are some nuances in some places that are somewhat different. Okay, um, next slide. So in the next few minutes, just for a few, I'm gonna throw some slides at you. And, and, and this, these are from the latest Asian barometer wave of data, which is surveys that were conducted from 2013 through this year. And it basically, it, now we're in eight Southeast Asian countries. I'm very pleased about that. We just went into Myanmar last year. We're going into East Timor 
God willing, next year. Uh, so we have this, we're trying to get all of the countries in Southeast Asia empowered. And the reason why survey research is important is that I think it helps us to begin to think about these issues, not from the perspective of experts or elites, but from the, why, how ordinary people think about these things. And this is, again, a bit of precursor to the discussions of elections. So this is what we ask people, how do they perceive inequality? And you're welcome to take pictures and you know, whatever you want to do with them. And I'm happy to share with the slides with you as well. We can see considerable variation. I want to pull out a few that I think is uh, quite, in quite interesting. Is that the majority, 60% of Singaporeans think things are equal. That's 60% of people you probably don't know. <laughs> but, but it's still 60% it's still <laughs> in that context. Uh, and, and this, and again, it tells you how things are, particularly in a set of ways. Well, in the contrast, the Philippines uh, um, actually have a very different perception. All right, we're looking at almost 68% to think about it, things that are very unfair. So we have very different perceptions in, South, in individual Southeast Asian countries about this. I know, I know where the slide thing is. Thank you. I got it. <laughs> I want you to look down sometimes, <laughs> actually often. But yes. Um, now, the next slide here, which I think is also, again, a very interesting dimension that I think is useful for you, and that is <laughs> Southeast Asia is also quite distinct especially from other regions, in that they conceptualize, they think of democracy as being equality to a higher degree than other regions do. So, and this is a fascinating dimension because, you know, we, everyone perceives democracy as something different. So, for example, on November 8th of this year, I am voting <laughs> all right, in the United States for obvious reasons. <laughs> and I'll vote for a woman. <laughs> Right? I think that we see in this particular Southeast Asia dimensions, we see, for example, even in Singapore, where they don't perceive high levels of inequality, 31% of Singaporeans think that democracy means equality. This is a very interesting dimension. A little bit less, very high, 36% in the case of Vietnam, uh, and very high in the place of Myanmar, 37%. This is an interesting idea and element about uh, how, they, how people perceive and, and conceptualize their political systems that they want. These are how they're perceived. This, is, this slide captures survey research and how people look, perceive government intervention, whether or not people are treat, the government treats people rich and poor fairly, uh, equally. And of course, we see really important divides somehow in Thailand. They think everyone is being treated the same, in contrast to Philippines on the other spectrum. Uh, this is an interesting slide. We ask people, uh, do they have concerns about economic vulnerability? Uh, how do, how, in the, and these are, this is the result of those that have very high levels of concern, with Malaysians at 83% at a very sharp and stark set of numbers. Singapore is only 40%. These, and this is, again, in part, uh, my attempt to try to bring in a little bit of the people into this discussion. Here's the question we ask, should, you, should inequality be the government's responsibility? And again, overwhelming majorities, especially in places like Indonesia, <laughs> that paternalistic sense of intervention. So when governments come to elections, they are conscious of these sets of issues. And this helps to frame their campaigning, it helps to frame their interaction with different segments of the population. And because I knew there were people like Alex Sal in the room, I thought I would actually introduce another slide here, which is, this is a slide that is a composite of showing how many people in the different parts of Southeast Asia uh, in countries are liberal versus those that are more conservative. I have to move quickly now. And you can see that also affects views of, it, of, of questions about issues associated with income distribution. So now I move to what Cherian has asked me to do. So he will, and here we go. There are five points that I want to get across, and I have five minutes, so I'll try to do my best. The first is, is that elections in Southeast Asia take place at unequal playing fields. They are malapportioned, they are gerrymandering, they are rigged. 
pure and simple. Uh, and they happen in different ways, whether or not it's creating an interesting presidential type of system, or whether or not it involves creating constituencies that take on different sets of, uh, of structures. Uh, recently, this last week, the government of Malaysia has introduced a new delineation exercise. I'm showing you a picture from that. These are the green lines, are the new electoral boundaries. All bizarre, all around housing districts, in particular ways, using economic and social data that they GIS map to make, and who is what political support and others to make this district in this particular set of ways. And we see this exacerbates rural urban divides, and in fact also it makes sure that some vote is worth 10 to 15 times more than a vote of another person. The two countries in the region that have the highest malapportionment are Myanmar and Malaysia in Southeast Asia. And, they, and gerrymandering, well, you don't have to look far. <laughs> <laughs> Malaysia is a good example. The camera is here. All right, the second point I want to raise in the discussion of elections, and that is there is the mobilization of inequality. And particularly, this is something that is very strategic. Uh, I was thinking about this wonderful book. Um, I'm sure many of you have read it. It won the Booker Prize uh, about a decade ago. The White Tiger, who descri about India, describes the wonderful use of vote banks <laughs> the, uh, in, the, in the context of South Asia. We have this long practice of basically buying rural votes. And people tell me how much they get. And sometimes it's simple, only $10. And that sounds like a symbolic thing. Sometimes it's more, 200 300 and I have to ask myself, would it take, how much would it take for me to vote for the man? No money. <laughs> but for others, it may change. And, that, and so what we see here is that the whole process of vote banks and vote banking have become sophisticated. And they don't work in places like Indonesia, but they continue to work in places like Thailand, the Philippines, and Malaysia. The third question, the third issue, in terms of the issue, relationship, is that they are, the campaigns increasingly deal directly with inequality. And we are seeing uh, uh, economic mobilization. The 2014 election in Indonesia was very much about mobilizing the little people against the system. Even though it was the people who were mobilizing were actually big people. <laughs> but the reality was still the, this particular set of dynamics. We're seeing the rise of populist cash transfer initiatives, all part of campaigns. And these have policy implications because they are promises that have to be delivered afterwards. And this I want to emphasize, this can have a positive and a negative dimension. A positive dimension is that it introduces a sense of interest for poor people and that they're actually getting some benefit and poor and disadvantaged communities. At the same time, a negative dimension in that those initiatives are usually short-lived. So people spend their cash very quickly. And so it doesn't have long-term development trajectories to actually have sustainability for those communities. But we see that the aim of reducing inequality has now become part of political campaigns. <coughs> they win by manipulating economic vulnerability. 63% of Malaysians said they took some sort of money or some item during the campaign period. 64% in my poll in Singapore said the same thing. So what you're seeing is that their patronage networks are expanding, but what's interesting about the contemporary context is increasingly they involve the government and government resources and taxpayer resources. So what's the dynamics is that it's that governments in power use the money they get from the people for the sets of people to stay in power so that other people can get more money. <laughs> but not necessarily the poor people. And we have a good example here. The final point about elections that I want to mention is that we are seeing the rise of what I call the patron, the poor patron. Joko Lee, who is of course seen as the positive one, he's the one who's supposed to be saving all the young people. We look at his policies, we've seen very limited areas that although his agenda, education, and civil service reform are very meaningful, they still have had minimal impact in changing a lot of the conditions on the ground. While Duterte, while people may find his language revolting, the fact is he is very adept and, he is, and he, his campaign was very much about marginalizing disadvantage, especially those from the South. And his use of language is very, very um, um, exciting for those that people find it stimulating. Let me close now because I've received that wonderful one uh, and sign.
among Southeast Asians for equality and for policy interventions. Inequality and equality do matter to Southeast Asians in meaningful ways. But the elections themselves don't necessarily provide that benefit. They are manipulated, and inequality is actually used to the advantage. It has short-term effects, but not necessarily long term And I think the, the, the directions are worrying because elections by themselves are only a moment in time, and that the politics for inequality has to happen after and before the elections, not during the campaign. Thank you very much.